Uh, we have the pleasure to have our first lecturer be someone who's incredibly intertwined with the school at this point. Uh, Robin Osler is both a visiting critic here at the school this semester, and she is also has the opening uh, exhibition in our gallery space downstairs, for which there will be a reception after this lecture. So as an introduction, uh, Robin Elmsley Osler established EOA Elmsley Osler Architect in 1996. Prior to, per to pursuing her architectural career, Robin spent 10 years as a model, beginning as Oscar de la Renta's house model, and moving on to Europe, where she worked extensively with Helmut, Helmut Newton, Giorgio Armani, and others. She attended Kenyon College, Tyler School of Art, majoring in metals, and received her Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Virginia, and her Master's of Architecture from Yale University. Robin was also awarded a fellowship in the American Association of University Women. Prior to opening her namesake office, she worked for Caesar Pelley and Associates, Frank Lupo and Dan Rowan of NY Architects, and Lee Skolnick Architecture and Design Partnership. Uh, Robin has held faculty positions at Parsons School of Design, Yale University, Pratt Institute, and City College of the City of New York. Uh, she comes from a, an architectural family with strong American roots, and I, I hope you don't mind if I read them, they're really fascinating. <laughs> uh, beginning with her great uncle, George Grant Elmsley, who worked with Louis Sullivan alongside Frank Lloyd Wright. Elmsley later went on to form his own office, Purcell Elmsley, and was one of the primary figures of the Prairie School. Her grandfather, Emil Lorch, uh, established the School of Architecture at the University of Michigan and brought Saarinen from Finland to teach in Ann Arbor, where the relationship between Saarinen and George Booth would give birth to Cranbrook. Can Cranbrook. I'm not done yet, there's even more. Her father, <laughs> David Osler is a well-known architect in Michigan, uh, where he was awarded the AIA gold medal. And her brother, Peter, is a Rome Prize-winning landscape architect. Osler has distinguished herself by creating a studio with, diverse, with a diverse per, excuse me, portfolio of elegant built work, including houses, retail stores, nonprofit facilities, galleries, commercial and public spaces. And finally, EOA is currently engaged in implementing the urban farming food chain, which I'm so sure we'll see more of tonight. I'd like you all to give a good welcome to Robin Osler. Thank you. And I'm, you can all hear me fine? This is good. I'm not sure I see any of my students here, which, OK, there's two of them, <laughs> which means that the others are back in the studio working, right, because we have a pinup. Um, so I'm going to. I'm going to talk about ideas because ideas are our currency. I think architects have a unique responsibility in the way that we get our ideas or our ideas in general. It's what we use to distinguish ourselves from the rest of the world. And it's also what makes us, I would argue, a very valuable commodity. So specifically, I'm going to talk to you about how my office uses ideas from a variety of sources to to inspire us and to shape our work. So these are just some examples as an introduction to some of our work. Um, we, of course, use technology in our work to produce drawings and renderings, and also often to manipulate a form or a space. But when I began gathering images to talk tonight I, and about our work, I really began to realize that most of our guiding ideas come from the, wheel, the real world instead of from the virtual world. So before we begin a project, we typically sit down together and discuss what it is about the program that we're working on that we find particularly challenging or unique or inspiring, intriguing. And we try and find something to sink our teeth into that can lead us toward a solution that's more layered and nuanced than just a straightforward solution to the program. And we, uh, you know, of course we, res we work on responding to, to the program in a very clear way. We want to make sure that things are done with great clarity and concisely. But what's going to take our heads beyond that? What's going to make this project one that responds to the way we as a studio see the world? And what is going to speak to the unique character of that particular project? That's what we're really looking for. So much of our work is distinguished by an attention to detail and to materials. So we tend to direct our research and discussions in a direction that's going to lead us toward making certain material choices that will then give 
each project its distinct identity. And actually, oftentimes, this is just a sample of our materials library. I will just go and stand in front of this wall of stuff and do a scope and see if there's something that catches my eye. And we also do extensive research into materials. And we search. We go through books. We actually use books a lot. And we do search online as well. But we look through books on architecture. We look through books on fashion. We look at art. We look at a lot of artists' work. We look at photography. We look at landscape. Landscape is a particularly inspiring element to us. We look at science. That's another one. We pretty much look at everything. Um, we familiarize ourselves with the area and its characteristics, and we try and dig a little deeper into who that specific client is. And we arrive at a rather organic mix of stuff that we then organize for ourselves to use as a guide and as inspiration, but we also present it to the client. And this is just an example of actually a presentation that we put together to talk about a proposal that we were making to a particular client. So to illustrate our process, I wanted to show you four, four different projects that each one has a different source. The first is cultural, the second is landscape, the third is the client, and the fourth is a social issue. And among all of these, there are overlaps. There are definitely overlaps. But the, the first spark, that thing that really got us going, that led us toward the solution for each of these projects, each one of those is actually unique to that project. So for the first one, it's a project called Ameridian. And we used a cultural idea to guide us. Ameridian is a gallery, but it's also a retail store that deals in sub-Saharan art and objects. The word Ameridian itself is a combination of a Zulu word. Um, it's the Zulu word for ancestral spirits. Ahmad Lozi, with the geographic term Meridian. And the owners, who were South African, were very explicit about their desire to have the space represent a new South Africa, one that was definitely modern but still had a foot in the craft and the rich cultural history of the continent. And they specifically wanted to counter the prevailing view of what Fraser Conlon, Fraser Conlon is one of the owners, he called it the typical African curio experience. So this is essentially just a lot of junk. And he wanted to counter that perception of Africa, particularly the new Africa. So we started by looking at images of some of the art that they would be representing and would be featured in the store. This is, these are some examples. This, this um, basket on the right is actually very typical of a certain type of work that they do. A lot of the work that the craftspeople do, they use recycled materials. And these are made out of telephone wires and cable wires. And they're highly prized. Um, we looked at small scale contemporary projects. And we also looked at contemporary residences in the townships. And these are shacks. And you'll see that there is an idea about recycling here as well. We also looked at some of the indigenous architecture. And one of the pieces that was one of the projects or one of the, the, the uh, indig indigenous representatives that was very important to the owner were the Zimbabwe ruins. And these are a, a cultural and historical landmark in South Africa. And they're the second largest ruins south of the Great Pyramids. And they're built, they were built by the Shana kings and were inhabited by them for 200 years. And for us, we saw these. There was an organic rawness um, that was quite beautiful that we wanted to respond to. And we were also drawn to a lot of the indigenous work and the relationship it had with the natural <coughs> environment. So one of the things that seemed to be the prevailing theme that we picked up from familiarizing ourselves with all of these things was an idea about texture. Texture that was created by a repetition of materials. And there was also a distinct reference to natural tones and materials of stone and grasses and clay were the materials that consistently appeared. 
And we didn't think it was appropriate to pick up on the vibrant color idea. Um, and these are actually, this is a, a exterior wall from one of the shacks in the townships. And this is actually an, a piece of, a, this is a photographic, it's a pho photography art piece. The centerpiece is actually one of the, the studios that they represent. Um, but we didn't want to pick up on this because so many of the objects that they'd be selling had so much color in them, as you see in the centerpiece there, that we didn't want to create a space that would compete with that. So we decided to focus on the idea of texture through repetition. We wanted to find a neutral, modern, elegant material to work with that would also not break a pretty tight budget. And the program was very, very simple. They basically needed a space to show their work, and they needed an office. And the items that they sell come in a variety of scales, large and quite small. So we wanted to allow all of the pieces to have their place without getting lost. We needed to think about how to organize the space clearly so that the objects could also be displayed in an environment that tapped into this idea of the new Africa. So it was really trying to, to marry these two things. And the existing footprint lent itself pretty easily to an enfilade of spaces. The front, it was, it was very, quite narrow and long. And the, the front was a bit constricted, and then it opened up into a slightly wider area. And the, at the back of the space, there's a, a storage area and a bathroom. So that seemed the logical place to put the, bath, the, the office. And what this did was that it created sort of this middle belt zone where the bulk of the display area could be located. So to emphasize this central zone, we really thought we wanted to define it more clearly. So we thought about using a specific material to define this area that might be different from how we treated the other zones. And we wanted to create a thick wall, this is this piece here, that would be pulled off of the east wall, which is here, creating an intimate corridor where these smaller objects could be displayed and there could be somewhat of a, of a sense of discovery. So this is the street entrance here and you can see it's quite narrow and then it opens up into this wider space here with the rear area being the office. And we left the perimeter walls exposed brick back here to create, to make it a little bit darker actually. So what we ended up using is our material, which was inspired by stone, but we couldn't afford it. And we actually wanted to use concrete because we thought, well, the floor is concrete, so wouldn't it be great to be able to wrap that up a wall? But of course, we couldn't afford that either. So <laughs> budget determines a lot, you'll find. Um, so we used homosote, and we stacked it. And this is actually, it came from when I was in graduate school, we used to make our model bases out of homo stacking it. At the time, it had formaldehyde in it, so you had to wear a mask when you sanded it, but it, they removed that, so it's a lot safer now. But what's great about it is that <laughs> it's, it's an acoustical material, so it also creates an acoustical quality to the space. So in this way, we were able to create that repetitive texture that we wanted and also give what we saw was a modern interpretation of stone. So the wall defining that intimate small object space. Oops. Well, you can see it through the laser. Um, it's thick, and you have the opportunity to really experience that thickness as you're walking through the space. And the, originally, the idea was to wrap it up over the ceiling and back over the opposite wall really creating a, really emphasizing that central zone, but again, budget intervened. So we could just have a central wall. But this wall has really become the signature of the space. And people are drawn to it when they come in. They want to touch it. They want to understand what it's made out of. It's very soft. It's actually an extremely durable material. Um, it has held up very, very well to all those greasy hands touching it. Um, and what it does is that it frames and allows views into that darker space, the small object space beyond where there is no overhead lighting, which was intentional. We just have light coming through from the central space and then the, the case that holds the small objects has lighting in it. 
And that was always to allow those small objects to really have a place of their own. So then working with the facade, the existing was not very retail friendly and as you can see was not really anywhere near expressive of this new Africa. So we decided to do a little surgery. And we were not allowed to remove the columns, so we decided to just ignore them. And we just inserted our facade behind it. It's about four or five feet back, and we just didn't want to engage with them at all. So we used a porcelain panel as our material to make a clean break from this sort of more residential toned cherry of the doors and we opened up the facade with glass and that door handle was actually carved by one of their artists. And the color of the panel was chosen because this was a reference to what had been taken as the, the by Fraser for their company communications. It, in essence, it's their branding identity. He wanted the logo to communicate an idea about minerals because South Africa is mineral rich, so this green actually has a slight iridescence to it. And um, the dotted lines are a reference to the meridians wrapping the globe, and the dashed line is meant to represent the footpath of the traditional nomadic African history. Um, so it was, it was really this idea of the new Africa that we understood through looking at images of their artwork and crafts and of the indigenous work, coupled with the, I mean, the Zimbabwe ruins really had a huge influence on us that that's what really drove our response here. And all of these things for us are ultimately a reflection of what we think is the, it's the culture of this new Africa. So moving out of Africa, um, the second project is, has to do with landscape. And it was located in, it's located in Burlingame, California. And Burlingame is a town just south of San Francisco and it's, it's quite lovely, it has this very nicely scaled central shopping district surrounded by small scale residential, mostly bungalows and um, low rise apartment buildings. And we'd been hired recently by Anthropology to bring a fresh point of view to their brand. They'd been working with the same design firm from the beginning of their company and they felt they needed to revisit the store concepts with someone who didn't have this long history with them. And the brand, if any of you are familiar with it, they're actually a subsidiary of Urban Outfitters. They're very successful, so we couldn't completely reinvent the wheel here. But we could take the essence of their concept and put it through our filter. And that would give us something different. So for Burlingame, we had this very, very long site on a side street off of the central shopping area. And this is actually the site itself, there had been a fire. So the only thing that was left was the, um, the facade, really just the screen of the facade, and the rear wall and steel columns, and that was it. And we had 90 feet here, which is quite large. So, and this is, this is, this, this is the facade. And they were actually, the, the main concern of the community board was that chicken chicken had burned down. So um, this really interesting experience being at a community board meeting. Um, so one of the things that we felt was the challenge here was how to design the facade with this 90 foot footprint in such a way that there was some dynamic as people walked along the street edge there. So for us, one of the elements that's very apparent in Northern California, for any of you who are familiar with it, is the quality of the light. And light is really a regional element. Um, the light in the north has a particular tint to it that's very different from the light in the southwest, that's very different from the light in the south, that's very different from the light on the coasts, and so much of this depends on the surrounding landscape that reflects that light. So we began to look at that light that's specific to Northern California and how could we tap into it, which of course naturally led us to the landscape. And near our site was this long alley of very beautiful tall eucalyptus trees on the street. It was on a street that ran parallel to our site that got us thinking about using wood as a potential material. And 
there really is a, there's a texture to this area that is expressed through a sense of the landscape that was something we saw quite a bit of potential in. So how, you know, how do you express that in the building? So we decided to work with layers of materials and textures that would then create a series of layers in the facade. So that as you walked along this long street front, the face of the building, the rhythm of your experience would be slightly variegated and intriguing, much like walking along the edge of a forest. And we created screens. These screens are made out of Ipe rods, and their space to show behind it is a translucent fabric scrim that allowed light to penetrate. And one of the things we wanted to have here was a, a, a sense that there was a depth to the facade. And interspersed along the screen are these, we've placed these copper tubes. And I've always thought of the copper tubes as sort of like a necklace draping this facade. And they would reflect light in a different way, but also they would patina over time, showing the effect of the environment on the facade, which we also thought was really important to show that the materiality of our building really communicated the impact of the environment. And in other areas, we created these bays made out of crenellated concrete. So volumetrically, these would appear as solid blocks as a contrast to the screens and, of course, to the transparent storefront. But the scale of the blocks is broken down by creating this texture. And we couldn't afford <laughs> to cast this in place. So the way that this was constructed was that these are actually a series of tiles or bricks, really. They're bricks. But they're three feet long by eight inches high. And they're stacked. And they're held together by steel rods. And one of the really nice things that happened is that because each tile was cast separately, they're all slightly different. So there's a texture that you get not only from the actual um, three-dimensionality of it, but also from the color of it. And on the inside, these bays became light wells with sky, skylights above. And part of that was this idea of separating them from the rest of the building, and also this idea of when you walked in, you would turn around and you would see light coming from these places that you thought had been quite solid from the exterior. And one of the bays had uh, resin bricks inserted into its wall. You can see that here. And you can see it a little bit on the right. Um, part, that was to allow it to glow on the inside from, during the day. And at night, it would glow from the inside out. And we all, what we also wanted to do was communicate this idea that there was a life behind those solid volumes. So by creating a facade with these layers, we were, we were actually able to highlight the facade at night as well by installing lighting behind the screens. And so the facade glows at night, which we really wanted it to do. So it's not just the storefront windows that naturally are going to be illuminated, but it's really the entire face of the building. And it creates a texture and a warmth that activates the street in a subtle way and makes it a place where people actually want to walk by at night. So the third project is the client-driven one. And we were very fortunate to have two very interesting clients, both very creative in their own fields, Tom Klinkostein and Elizabeth Gillette. And we had already designed a project for Tom, which was a combination of two very small apartments in a, on a fifth floor walk up in Soho. So all of the stuff had to be carried up five flights. And that gave us an opportunity to get to know him and his interests. And this is one of many, many quotations that Tom sent me. And he literally sent me pages of just stuff, like from Marshall McLuhan, um, various other literary references, um, philosophical references. He also sent me images of planets. Um, and this is my client, um, because he discussed extensively his interest in outer space. He's a consultant and a professor of new media, and he had always wanted to be an astronaut when he was a kid. And he wrote letters for years and finally got admitted into that space camp in Huntsville, Alabama. So that's what this is from. 
And he provided us with images, and these are these Polaroids that are fabulous. They're um, taken from his two favorite films, this uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001, and the classic, The Day the Earth Stood Still. And he, you'll see the muting note there. He took them off his television. Um, and this is a computer guy, you know? But it was particularly this image. Um, I mean, the others had an impact too, but this was the one that really, really sort of got to me of, you know, the alien, the shadow in this very elegant spaceship showing all the shadows of layers, and that really piqued my interest. And it started us on this exploration of materials and light to create, you know, to try and create some spatial and visual layering. So at Tom's, this was translated into some areas where we were able to manipulate some ideas of privacy and visibility. We used a, a scrim material. We actually used insect screen. It's a, it's a material I like a lot because it's really inexpensive, and it comes in these really big rolls. Um, it's 10 feet long, and it's very inexpensive. And it's gray, and it's really, really elegant. It's very nice. Um, so we used this as a scrim material. Um, and opening up the bath so that he could sit in the tub and look out over the entire space, and that would also bring light into the space. This was a very small apartment. And this, is, this was the first project we did for him. So when we began to work with Tom and Beth, there was an, Beth was the additional character in the story now. And they had purchased a raw loft space in Tribeca. And similar to the process of Tom's first project, there was a very lively exchange of questions and communications and images. And because we had the addition of Beth this time, she's an accessories and a fashion designer who works a lot with fabrics and textures. So she introduced herself by sending us swatches of weaves that she was experimenting with and developing within her own work. And she also sent us some fashion images. And the, the image on the right-hand side here is of a Jill Sonder dress from a collection that was actually quite unusual for Jill Sonder at the time because it was much more diaphanous than what she was typically producing at that time. But she also had uh, her own series of written notes. And one of the ones that, this is the one that totally got me, when she was referring to the light and sound quality that she was looking for, she wrote, the light inside the snow huts I built as a child growing up in Ohio. And that was it. And that, that was really it. I mean, I grew up in Michigan, so I know what that light's about. I know that there is a, you know, people see snow and they think cold, but there's actually a warmth to that light, which is very strange because it's a blue light. And there's actually a sound quality to that. And so that really became the idea that drove a lot of the decisions. So this is the space that we had to work with. And uh, it was quite challenging because it only had light coming in from one side, which is here. And this is facing east. And there's another building directly across the street there. Um, the entry is down here. So because of the layout where the light was, you know, you think, well, you want to bring the public area toward the light, but we couldn't really do that because you didn't want to have to walk through a private area to get to the public area. And we also had this funny little dog leg here, which lent itself very well to something private. So just a quick walk through here. This is the entrance. This is the guest bath. This is the living dining area here. This is a laundry room, kitchen, master bath. This is a, it was a guest room. Now their daughter lives here. Uh, we raised the back area here 18 inches to help create a sense of privacy because we knew that we were going to have to leave some of it open or use some sort of materials to allow the light to penetrate more deeply into the space. So if we raised the floor a little bit, then that could give a hint that this was a slightly different quality, character of space. <laughs> So this is Tom's office, this is Beth's office, this is a dressing room, and this is the master bedroom. So because of this challenge with the light, we had an opportunity to use a variety of screening materials, which we could use to modulate the light, and also used it to suggest a separation between the public and private, as I was saying. 
And one of the materials that we used was translucent laminated glass. And there's a lot of translucent laminated, uh, translucent glass. We use a lot of acid etched glass. But the nice thing about this glass, and I don't think they make it anymore, unfortunately, was that the laminate transforms as you move around it and the way, and when light hits it. So there are times that it's translucent, and then there are times when you're looking at it from a certain angle that it's actually opaque. And these are Tom and Beth's offices. This is Tom's office. This is Beth's office. And they're literally right next to each other because she talked about how she liked to be able to see Tom when he was working. So there was already a discussion about watching each other. They, they like to see, sense each other's presence nearby. Um, and we used this material uh, for a screen that is called hog wire. And it's actually a landscape fabric that's put underneath um, earth and gravel to stabilize, but also to allow water to filtrate through and also grass to grow through it. It's a, and it's got a, a real three-dimensional quality to it. And it, I really like it because it's white, and so it has a slightly cloudy look to it, um, particularly when it's seen from a distance. And it really became a reference to some of Beth's work and that Jill Sonder dress. And it also reflected a certain kind of light that was like the snow huts. And it also went back to Tom's images from the previous project, the day the earth, the earth stood still images. And the other material we used, again, it actually was insect screen, but this time we laminated it between glass. And here we used it as the first layer at the bath. And it creates, by putting it in glass, it creates a waterproof layer, but it also allows the person in the bathtub to see out and also for light to come in. So the bath is, it really became the most concentrated opportunity to create a series of these layers because of the inherent public-private issues and also because Tom and Beth had opened themselves up for this. Um, because of bathing and because of the light, they did talk about wanting, I didn't, you know, they didn't want to be shut off in this bathroom. So the first layer is the glass with the insect screen. The second layer, which you can just see him of it here, is actually, it's made up of sliding chalkboard doors that close over the glass and they meet at this corner here. So they effectively can make the bath a very private space in case there's company there. And the third layer is the hog wire, which you see here. And it wraps around this column and by, it gives it a little space, creates a hallway there that takes you to that guest bedroom. And it's set into a curving steel frame. So when the chalkboard doors are open, the layers of the insect screen and the hog wire really create this sort of veil to somewhat blur the bather. But it also is still allowing the light in. And throughout the entire loft, there are these blurry moments, but it's really here at the bath where the layering of more than one physical material in most of the other places, it was one material that inherently had a sort of blurry quality to it. And using light also as a medium, this is really where the most evocative moment occurs. And I also think it's here as well where the both clients' personalities are, are best expressed. So here it was really very client driven and we were very fortunate to have clients that were willing to engage with us at that level. So then the fourth project was inspired by a social issue, a social need, which is access to healthy food in economically depressed areas. And I came to this project somewhat circuitously. I was introduced to a woman, Taja Seville. She was an R&B singer. She'd been signed by Prince, and I think she had some hits in the 90s. Um, but she was, I, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> love is something, I don't know. But um, she's a very interesting woman, and she's from Detroit. And she had founded an organization in Detroit called Urban Farming. And we were introduced through a mutual friend. And she started the organization in Detroit because if any of you are familiar with that particular city, there is great poverty. There, 
it's basically the entire city is a food desert and there's lots of vacant land. So he, we were introduced by a mutual friend and she came to my office and we were working on an anthropology project at that time in Huntsville, Alabama. And for this particular store, we had integrated some very large living walls on the facade at the time. I think they might still be the, the largest living wall installation in North America. I'm sure that'll be eclipsed very soon if it hasn't been already. But these, the, the medium in these walls is sedum. And she asked me, well, can you grow food on those walls? And I actually didn't know. So I contacted the people at Green Living Technologies, which were the people that were, uh, they manufactured the system that we were using. Um, and we had worked with them on this store, and we had also worked with them on a store in Jackson, Mississippi, where we had used the same system. And they said, yes, as a matter of fact, you can. We've started experimenting with it ourselves. So I thought, okay, that's great. You don't really need an architect. I can just introduce you to George and you can do your thing and I can get back to my work. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. You know, what if I bring architecture to this? What if I use the ideas that are our currency and make it into an architectural project? So I basically, I sat down and I just wrote a program. And I wrote a program the way that I would for a studio. You know, basically, and thinking of it as a studio project, that's how I really had to start it in my mind. And I, came, I, uh, I started with a very simple idea that was inspired by Frederick Law Olmsted's Emerald Necklace in Boston, which was a series of parks that are loosely linked together. And essentially parks at the outset, and basically still are, um, they were seen at the outset as a way to promote healthy options for people who lived in cities to give them exposure to nature, fresh air, areas for walking or contemplation. So why not take this idea and apply food to it? So the emerald necklace became the food chain with walls of food being like the parks. A system that could provide healthy access or access to healthy locally grown produce to improve the lives of people who inhabit cities. And Taja wanted the pilot project to be in Los Angeles in Skid Row. And for any of you that know anything about Los Angeles, this is an area of the city and it's really an area of the country that is literally ground zero in terms of dealing with homelessness and addictions and poverty in the city. And the neighborhood has sprouted numerous missions and shelters purely to service this population. And it's now, in a way it's a little disturbing. It's actually become part of the urban fabric and it's part of what distinguishes this neighborhood from any other neighborhood in Los Angeles. So there are three program pieces. The walls, and they're all six feet tall by 30 feet long. We had, obviously we had limited lengths to work with because of where these things were going and we kept them at six feet high so access could be very, very easy. We didn't want to have ladders be required because there was a whole liability issue at, at stake here if we had had people climbing up on ladders. So each one of these walls actually provides a quarter of a ton of produce over the course of a year. They have four growing seasons. I mean, it's so they're lucky in Los Angeles to be able to grow basically all year round. The second part are the containers. And these are a way to identify and brand the project so that anywhere you encounter one of these walls, you're going to see these boxes and you go, oh, that's another link in the chain. And they also provide a place for donors' names to be displayed, which is very important to people who've given money to the project. And they also are a place to store small gardening tools. And the third piece, which I've always called the heart, is a kitchen that would be accessible and open to the street where the idea is to get local chefs and cooking school students to come down and volunteer their time and teach people how to actually make meals with the food that they harvest from the walls. 
And this is just a basic prototype. Um, the idea was to keep it super, super simple. We were going to, we want to use a, a material called poly panel, which is made out of recycled bottles, plastic bottles, and it's, it's pretty impervious. So you could literally hose this thing down on the inside if you had to. Um, and just a simple volume. Um, it doesn't work, but um, appliances and counter space on one side with an island, and then just open space and a simple platform it, on the other side so that you could get the maximum amount of people in with easy viewing, and also a green wall at the front that you would grow herbs on for use in the, in the cooking demonstrations. And um, we partnered with Cal Poly in the beginning to pre-grow the trays, because it's always good to get the roots locked in place before you put them up on a wall. And the system is really very, very easy to install. This is the tray on the left. And they are typically six to eight inches in depth. They're made out of stainless steel. And they just have a small continuous angle on the back, and they just literally just hook onto an angle that's attached to the wall. And they interlock one into the other, and those little X's that you see in the walls of the tray are to allow water to run through gravity down through the cells. So there's a water tube, a copper tube at the top that feeds, it's just a drip feed, and there's a gutter at the bottom, and it's a recirculating system. So there are currently four walls in Los Angeles, one at the Weingart Center and one at the Rainbow Apartments. Both of those are missions with residential facilities down in Skid Row. One is at the Los Angeles County Food Bank or Regional Food Bank, and one is at the Miguel Contreras Learning Center, which is a primarily Latino-based student, uh, student body school in downtown Los Angeles. And there are a couple of things that have happened since these walls were installed that confirm their effectiveness. And it might be in small ways, but this is how it starts. Um, when we were installing the walls at the Weingart Center for the kickoff, butterflies and hummingbirds started to appear and all around the trays. And one, more than one of the counselors that worked in the missions told me they had never seen this before. They had never seen a butterfly. They had never seen a hummingbird. So it was literally transforming the direct ecosystem immediately. I mean, the trays were brought in. I think I arrived at you know 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning from literally the other side of the country, the easternmost part in Maine, and got to LA. And I thought, did they come in my suitcase? I mean, I really it was shocking. Um, the second anecdote is a story from a teacher at the Miguel Contreras Learning Center. And the school has started a gardening club to as a way to have kids get involved in an organized way. And they harvest the wall, they replant it, they learn about the food and what they can do with it. So um, a teacher had told me a story about one of the students who had never seen a fresh tomato before. The only tomato he'd ever seen was under the bun of a McDonald's cheeseburger. And he always threw it away because he had tasted it, I think, once, and it didn't have any flavor. And so he, whenever he got his cheeseburgers, he would just take it off and throw it away. And he had never seen a full tomato, so he actually didn't make the connection between that thing on his cheeseburger and the tomato on the wall. So he took the tomato off the wall, and he bit into it like an apple, which, of course, it looks sort of like an apple. It's round, so why wouldn't you eat it that way? And it completely blew his mind open. He had no idea that something could taste like that. And he wanted to take, he took it home to his family to show. And so, I mean, he was really excited about this. And this is a tomato, you know? I mean, some of us get excited about more complicated things. I mean, it's pretty great that someone can get that excited about a tomato. So his life has changed in some small way. And the people that live on Skid Row, where these walls are located, their lives have changed, too, in a small way. And they can all understand the difference in flavor between freshly harvested produce and that which comes in a can, which particularly on Skid Row, that's a lot of what they get, like the big vats of things. 
and maybe they've begun to understand how eating fresh produce can also impact their health. So this is what we do. We have ideas, but we also look for ideas. And we look for them in many different places because we feel that our projects can be more responsive to a client if we blow it open a little bit and go beyond our circumscribed world of architecture, if we look for inspiration in places that might be more deeply connected to that client or that program. And those ideas then lead us to make form and space and material choices that then can communicate something more than just solving the problem or the program. And when you apply that method to social issues, then we can potentially really make some things happen. And we can potentially change people's lives. And we can also have more fun doing what we do, which is critical. Thank you. It's OK with you if we ask a few questions? Sure. on now. All right, so I just need someone. Where's Hillary? <laughs> so I have a mic here if anyone would like to ask Robin a question. Don't be shy. I noticed this actually when my studio was in Washington last week, that they were very reticent to ask questions. They started to warm up. <laughs> yeah. Um, what we would like to do is get the kitchen done because that's, I mean, I really feel we can do the walls and we can do the containers actually fairly easily. And what we found that the urban farming organization that we've collaborated with, they don't, they're not really interested in the bricks and mortar thing. They're, they're farmers and that's what they do. So we have to figure out a way to get some people and some funding on board to get the kitchen done. And we've been actually looking at potential donors in the appliance industry because we think that maybe we can get, uh, you know, if we can get Kenmore or Amana or something, you know, a company that makes stoves and dishwashers and cooktops, refrigerators, if we can get them to kick up some money, then we can potentially get that started. Um, the project that we're doing in Washington, D.C. has the potential to be a real project the project that my studio is actually working on. So that might be end up being the next place where we do it. When you work in these colder climates, you actually have to consider what you're going to do in the winter. But that's actually fairly easily, excuse me, that's a fairly easily resolved by uh, you can cover the containers with something that's translucent that keeps it warm during the, the colder months. But also, yeah, so but you're, you're growing, what you're able to grow is probably somewhat limited. Um, but I think you could, it's definitely something that we're working toward. Because the idea is to take it across the country. We're trying to get the attention of the Obama administration. <laughs> be like the landscape or the culture or whatever um, do you determine like what inspires your ideas like after researching before the project or like do you think of this before you even start the project I think it happens um, it happens uh, before actually when we get the project we sit down and we start talking about I mean, every area or every program has its idiosyncrasies or its identifying elements that you may be able to pull from. And so we throw a lot of stuff on the table. Um, California, you know, it seemed 
a really obvious choice to us um, because, I mean, culturally, it, I mean, when we did the South African project, it's, there's definitely a culture that we were not that familiar with that we wanted to get to know more about and also if we were going to understand what they were going to, what they wanted to sell and how they, the, the owners were very, very specific about wanting to ex express a certain type of this new South Africa, our new Africa. Um, so we needed to educate ourselves. And um, I, I would argue that that's actually what makes each project so interesting for us to do. And one of the things that I think the reason why my office probably works this way, and this is my theory, is that because, as you saw, I come from this very deeply embedded architectural, like I have roots that go way back. Um, it was just the way I was raised. You know, when I first started teaching, I didn't quite understand why, well, you know, freshmen didn't know who Alvar Alto and Mies van der Rohe was. I mean, because I know who they were when I was six. You know, so and I realized, well, no, that's actually my job. You know, I have to teach these people who these people are. Um, so I think part of my interest in all these other things was fueled by this environment that I grew up in that was so deeply steeped in architecture that I was interested in all these other things. So this is a way of sort of expanding what we do beyond just making form for form's sake or just responding to the program. And I would, I would actually argue that it, it makes, you know, it makes it, it makes it certainly more interesting for you as an architect to look at all these other ways to get your ideas from. So it really starts at the beginning. And then that may lead us down towards something else. But sometimes we find things, you know, there may be, like when we work with science images or science concepts, like that might be something that we were led to because of something we saw in the landscape or something in the program that led us to look at actual like botany images for some sort of formal inspiration. So some of the ideas come from that initial one that, that you know, the ones that are probably less obviously related to what we do in terms of making form. Totally, totally. I mean, I, and I would argue that the past 10 years, so much attention has been given to architects for their cultural commissions. And, you know, I'm a cultural supporter. I go to the symphony. I, you know, I, these, things, these are things that feed me emotionally and intellectually. But they, and they're important. They are important to our overall well-being. But I would argue that they tend to be, they can be sort of the glamour projects, witnessed by the fact that the people that get to do them are sort of the, the big teams or stars or whatever. So I, you know, and, and it, that's an important part of our profession. It's definitely, it gets ideas out there, they've got the money behind them, it puts, you know, what's happening at Lincoln Center is fantastic. Um, it's changed the whole way that we experience that space in the city. But I would really, really argue that it's critical that architects take a more active role in determining sort of the social agenda of space because now more than ever, I mean, I think it's something that we really should have been doing all along and there's always been people that have done it, but I think that, you know, now it is really becoming critical with the issues with the environment and I think, um, you know, because architects lately have been so associated with the glamour projects, in a lot of way, people think, well, I'm not gonna hire an architect to do that. You know, if I wanna build a community center, or if I wanna build a farm, or if I, you know, and I would argue, well, no, actually, like the food chain, you know, it's like, no, it's actually when you bring design to the process that you can make it into a more compelling project. And that's what we do. And I mean, ideas are 
what we have. So we need to put them to a better use, I would argue. <laughs> Although I need those corporate clients too, you know, and those wealthy bankers, you know. <laughs> Dancing with the devil. <laughs> Hi, I'm just curious about your future work. Are you going out and seeking more of these social projects? Because from the way you talked about it, it seemed like you came up kind of with the idea and invented it and went out and found support. Are, are you currently sort of sitting back and looking for things coming or you're going out and trying to find more? I'm definitely going out, yeah. In fact, the agricultural center that we're doing in Washington, D.C. is one of those projects. Um, because, and that idea came about because we had been asked, you know, there was, it was a combination of the food chain and we had been asked by Urban Outfitters to do uh, a project for them called Terrain, which is, um, it's, a, it's a nursery. And they have one in Pennsylvania and what they do is that they buy existing nurseries. They're, this is the concept is that they would buy existing nurseries and then they make it into this very cool gardening center. And, um, it was in Paramus, New Jersey. It actually got shut down by the community, which was so weird. But um, that's what happens. But the planning of that thing, it was really interesting because there were greenhouse facilities. They, I mean, I have to say that the Urban Outfitters team do pretty brilliant merchandising. Um, so they were selling books, and they were selling bath products, and they were selling plants, and they were selling... Um, Furniture, garden furniture, they also had landscape <laughs> classes that they would give. They also had the services of landscape architects that they could hook, hook clients up with. And it was sort of a campus project. And I thought, well, that's, yeah, that's really smart. You know, it's, 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 you know, I can see why they want to do this. They want to make a lot of money off of this. People don't feel so guilty about buying a plant in a recession. It's better than a $600 pair of shoes, you know. Makes them feel good. Um, and I thought, well, wait a minute, what if you were to take that sort of retail merchandising idea and put it together with farming? And so the project that my students are working on is that project. And it's basically this idea of providing a place for food to be grown for uh, wholesale or to sell to local grocery stores and restaurants so that they can sell locally grown fresh produce, retail, farmer's market, restaurant. There's a health component. There's an educational component so that you create jobs. One of the things that we learned and one of the things that is very prevalent in a lot of the urban farming in this country right now is that it basically runs on volunteer labor. And that to me is unacceptable because the people that can volunteer their time are usually people that don't really need to, I mean, they, it's great, they're doing it, it's important, but they don't, they can go down to Whole Foods and buy that fresh organic tomato, you know, because they obviously have the luxury of time that they can volunteer it. Whereas the people that really need to be eating this food, they need jobs, you know? So the idea is to create a, a, an engine for people to, have paying jobs. At the same time, they're learning about growing food, they're working in the restaurant, they're learning you know, to be a chef, they're you know, going off and learning how to make cheese or you know, whatever. I mean, it's, it's, to me, that's the critical, critical element is that you need to be able to create an economic system that is self-sustaining. So that's, that's a project that I'm focusing on right now, definitely. I definitely want to take it out. But, you know, unfortunately, to balance it, a lot of times you have to take these other jobs that pay your bills and your people. Is the, the food chain, uh, one of those six by 30 foot walls, how much does that cost? Is it, is it sort of economically viable or? It, it is, you know, and it was actually pretty much donated. So um, I can't remember what it is per square foot because it's changed uh -huh. from what it was and also because that was donated. Everything was pretty much donated, including the labor. I mean, we spent just as, just so that you know you get an understanding of what it takes, we probably spent about I mean, well over $100,000 worth of our hours on that project. 
and we got 8,000. So it really was like. <laughs> <laughs> Just take it. <laughs> All right. Oh, wait, wait there. Well, I mean, it's interesting because I think, you know, when you start an office, you sort of don't know where it's going. <laughs> I mean, you want to get work, you, you, you know, and you sort of grab what you can. Um, the first project for Tom Klinkostein, the fifth floor walk-up, was a very early project for me. And um, I feel really lucky that that was an early project for me because he was a client that was engaged at a level that not very many clients are engaged at. And I would probably credit him for opening, opening that part of me up that has always been there because of the way I was raised, wanting to sort of look at other stuff, you know. Um, so I think it was always an element, you know. Um, certain times you can, you can use more or less of it. Um, I think people come to my office once they start working. I mean, I like to, to run, I, just, I consider it a very collaborative environment. Um, it's important for me to have people feel like they have a sense of ownership, that everybody's got good ideas, and you know, to put them out on the table and they'll be listened to and respected. Because also everybody comes from a different background. You know, everybody's past childhoods, whatever, you know, their family life, everything. They're coming from different parts of the country, they went to different schools, and they may be from different countries. You know, and all those people have something to contribute. So, um, you know, I actually think that a lot of offices are like that. You know, I don't think mine is that much different. It's just that probably the scale of it allows it to be a little bit more Slightly more organic. So. Great, thank you so much. I would invite everyone to come down to the reception and gallery.